Hi there, and welcome back. This is day number 341, and it's my great joy to read to you Amos 5 and 6, Isaiah 47, and the little letter of 3rd John. May the Lord bless you real good today, and let's open to Amos chapter 5. One device that Amos used in yesterday's reading was rhetorical questions. He asked a whole series of them like this one. Does a lion roar in the forest unless he has found a victim? All of his rhetorical questions expect the unspoken answer, no. And all of those questions led up to this one. The lion has roared. So who isn't frightened? The Sovereign Lord has spoken. Who can refuse to proclaim his message? And, surprisingly, the message the Lord proclaimed next was an invitation to Israel's enemies to come and witness Israel's destruction. After the unforgettable denunciation against Israel's wealthy women, whom he calls cows, he lists some of the previous acts of judgment against Israel, things like drought, and after each one are the words, But you still would not return to me. The chapter ended with these awesome words. So then, people of Israel, I'm going to punish you, and because I'm going to do this, Get ready to face my judgment. God is the one who made the mountains and created the hills. He makes his thoughts known to people. He changes day into night. He walks on the heights of the earth. This is his name, the Lord Almighty. Amos chapter 5 Heading, A Call to Repentance Amos speaks. Listen, people of Israel, to this funeral song which I sing over you. Virgin Israel has fallen, never to rise again. She lies abandoned on the ground, and no one helps her up. The Sovereign Lord says, A city in Israel sends out a thousand soldiers, but only a hundred return. Another city sends out a hundred, but only ten come back. The Lord says to the people of Israel, Come to me and you will live. Do not go to Be'er Sheba to worship. Do not try to find me at Bethel. Bethel will come to nothing. Do not go to Gilgal. Her people are doomed to exile. Amos speaks again. Go to the Lord, and you will live. If you do not go, he will sweep down like fire on the people of Israel. The fire will burn up the people of Bethel, and no one will be able to put it out. You are doomed, you that twist justice and cheat people out of their rights. The Lord made the stars, the Pleiades and Orion, he turns darkness into daylight and day into night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the earth. His name is the Lord. He brings destruction on the mighty and their strongholds. You people hate anyone who challenges injustice and speaks the whole truth in court. You have oppressed the poor and robbed them of their grain and so you will not live in the fine stone houses you build or drink wine from the beautiful vineyards you plant. I know how terrible your sins are and how many crimes you have committed. You persecute good people, take bribes, and prevent the poor from getting justice in the courts. And so, keeping quiet in such evil times is the smart thing to do. Make it your aim to do what is right, not what is evil, so that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty really will be with you, as you claim he is. Hate what is evil, love what is right, and see that justice prevails in the courts. 
Perhaps the Lord will be merciful to the people of this nation who are still left alive. And so the Sovereign Lord Almighty says, There will be wailing and cries of sorrow in the city streets. Even farmers will be called to mourn the dead along with those who are paid to mourn. There will be wailing in all the vineyards. All this will take place because I am coming to punish you. The Lord has spoken. Amos speaks. How terrible it will be for you who long for the day of the Lord. What good will that day do you? For you it will be a day of darkness, not of light. It will be like someone who runs from a lion and meets a bear, or someone who comes home and puts his hand on the wall only to be bitten by a snake. The day of the Lord will bring darkness and not light. It will be a day of gloom without any brightness. The Lord says, I hate your religious festivals. I cannot stand them. When you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not accept the animals you have fattened to bring me as offerings. Stop your noisy songs. I do not want to listen to your harps. Instead, let justice flow like a stream, and righteousness like a river that never goes dry. People of Israel, I did not demand sacrifices and offerings during those forty years that I led you through the desert. But now, because you have worshipped images of Sakuth, your king god, and of Kaiwan, your star god, you will have to carry those images when I take you into exile in a land beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the Almighty God. Amos chapter 6 Heading The Destruction of Israel Amos speaks How terrible it will be for you who have such an easy life in Zion and for you that feel safe in Samaria, you great leaders of this great nation, Israel, you to whom the people go for help. Go and look at the city of Kalne. Then go on to the great city of Hamath and down to the Philistine city of Gath. Were they any better than the kingdoms of Judah and Israel? Was their territory larger than yours? You refuse to admit that a day of disaster is coming, but what you do only brings that day closer. How terrible it will be for you that stretch out on your luxurious couches feeding on veal and lamb. You like to compose songs as David did and play them on harps. You drink wine by the bowl full and use the finest perfumes. But you do not mourn over the ruin of Israel. So you will be the first to go into exile. Your feasts and banquets will come to an end. The Sovereign Lord Almighty has given this solemn warning. I hate the pride of the people of Israel. I despise their luxurious mansions. I will give their capital city and everything in it to the enemy. Amos speaks. If there are ten men left in a family, they will die. The dead man's relative, the one in charge of the funeral, will take the body out of the house. The relative will call to whoever is still left in the house. Is anyone else there with you? The person will answer, No. Then the relative will say, Be quiet. We must be careful not to even mention the Lord's name. When the Lord gives the command, houses, large and small, will be smashed to pieces. Do horses gallop on rocks? Does anyone plow the sea with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into poison and right into wrong. You brag about capturing the town of Lodibar. You boast, we were strong enough to take Karnaim. The Lord Almighty himself says, 
People of Israel, I'm going to send a foreign army to occupy your country. It will oppress you from Hamath Pass in the north to the brook of the Araba in the south. We turn now to Isaiah 47. God continued speaking in Isaiah 46 about how he alone reveals his plans to mankind through prophecy. The section about Babylon's idols being led off on a heavy ox cart was dripping with irony. It says, This is the end for Babylon's gods. Bel and Nebo once were worshipped, but now they are loaded on donkeys, a burden for the backs of tired animals. Both the idols and their owners are bowed down. The gods cannot protect the people, and the people cannot protect the gods. They go off into captivity together. Isaiah 47 Heading Judgment on Babylon The Lord says, Babylon, come down from your throne and sit in the dust on the ground. You were once like a virgin, a city unconquered, but you are soft and delicate no longer. You are now a slave. Turn the millstone, grind the flour, off with your veil, strip off your fine clothes, Lift up your skirts and cross the streams. People will see you naked. They will see you humbled and shamed. I will take vengeance, and no one will stop me. Isaiah speaks. The holy God of Israel sets us free. His name is the Lord Almighty. The Lord says to Babylon, Sit in silence and darkness. No more will they call you the queen of nations. I was angry with my people. I treated them as no longer mine. I put them in your power, and you showed them no mercy. Even the aged you treated harshly. You thought you would always be a queen, and did not take these things to heart, or think how it all would end. Listen to this, you lover of pleasure, you that think you are safe and secure. You claim that you're as great as God, that there is no one else like you. You thought that you would never be a widow or suffer the loss of your children. But in a moment, in a single day, both of these things will happen. In spite of all the magic you use, you will lose your husband and children. You felt sure of yourself in your evil. You thought that no one could see you. Your wisdom and knowledge led you astray, and you said to yourself, I am God. There is no one else like me. Disaster will come on you, and none of your magic can stop it. Ruin will come on you suddenly, ruin you never dreamed of. Keep all your magic spells and charms. You have used them since you were young. Perhaps they will be of some help to you. Perhaps you can frighten your enemies. You are powerless in spite of the advice you get. Let your astrologers come forward and save you those people who study the stars, who map out the zones of the heavens, and tell you from month to month what is going to happen to you. They will be like bits of straw, and a fire will burn them up. They will not even be able to save themselves. The flames will be too hot for them, not a cozy fire to warm themselves by. That is all the good they will do you those astrologers you've consulted all your life. They will leave you and go their own way, and none will be left to save you. And now let's turn to Third John. Thomas Constable points out that Third John is the shortest letter in the New Testament 
and it is also the most personal. Certainly, 2 Timothy, for instance, was an intensely personal letter, but at the end, Paul greeted everyone, showing that he knew that his letter would be read to the church or churches. In 3 John, the recipient seems to be Gaius alone, and this letter follows a pattern like a normal secular letter of the time, not including a grace and peace salutation that Paul seems to have made standard for Christian letters. The time of the writing and the themes of this letter are like John's two other letters. The Letter of Third John From the Elder To my dear Gaius, whom I truly love. My dear friend, I pray that everything may go well with you and that you may be in good health, as I know you are well in spirit. I was so happy when some traveling brothers ministering for Christ arrived and told me how faithful you are to the truth, just as you always live in the truth. Nothing makes me happier than to hear that my children live in the truth. My dear friend, you are so faithful in the work you do for other brothers and sisters in Christ, even when they're strangers. They have spoken to the church here about your love. Please help them to continue their trip in a way that will please God. For they set out on their trip in the service of Christ without accepting any help from unbelievers. We believers, then, must help these people so that we may share in their work for the truth. I wrote a short letter to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to be their leader, will not pay any attention to what I say. When I come, then, I will bring up everything he has done, the terrible things he says about us, and the lies he tells. But that is not enough for him. He will not receive the traveling brothers who minister in the name of Christ, and even stops those who want to receive them into their homes and tries to drive them out of the church. My dear friend, do not imitate what is bad, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good belongs to God. Whoever does what is bad has not seen God. Everyone speaks well of Demetrius. Truth itself speaks well of him, and we add our testimony, and you know that what we say is true. I have so much to tell you, but I don't want to do it with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and then we'll talk personally. Peace be with you. All your friends send greetings. Greet all our friends personally. Let me start us in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, keep us from getting caught up in religion, meaning the man-made observances of ritual and rules that seem wise and makes people feel good about themselves, but which is the kind of busyness that you hate. It is religion that does nothing to control our sinful passions. Give us the true religion where we actually come to know you and are joined as one with you. Let justice flow like a stream and righteousness like a river that never goes dry. Also, Lord, Keep us away from the influence of church leaders who enjoy being the sole ruler of their little kingdoms. Protect us from leaders who do not lead by example, but by rules. Protect your flock from shepherds who do not love the sheep. Protect us from leaders who do not serve the flock, but only want people to serve them. Protect us from leaders who tell lies or engage in jealous gossip just to enforce their rule over the church. 
We praise you that most of our pastors are not like those just mentioned. Protect your flock from any practices that turn people from trusting in your gracious kindness to us and seek to turn our focus to working to gain points in your eyes. Thank you that there is no way that our feeble efforts can improve on the position you have already given us as your adopted children. Our sacrifice to you today is our heartfelt praise.